Um, so this session is, uh, what if? What if the youth of ASEAN ran the region? How would they do things differently or not uh, from the state of affairs uh, in ASEAN uh, today? Um, I'd like to, uh, I'm Zohar Abdul Karim. I'm the Asia editor of Time. We've got a terrific, terrific group here, uh, very diverse, very inclusive group. Uh, we've got to my right, uh, William Tanuijaya, who is uh, a co-founder of Tokopedia eight years ago, which is uh, 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 an online site which gives uh, businesses and individuals uh, the chance to sell and, and market their wares. So it's C2C, but it's also uh, B2B, and it's doing, doing very well. Um, next to William is uh, Cassandra Chu uh, uh, from Singapore, um, uh, uh, and she's a, an advocate uh, for the blind. Uh, uh, and uh, we also have, with Cassandra, we have Esme, her guide dog. Uh, uh, and we welcome Esme as well. <laughs> uh, Gina Rosero, uh, who's a Filipino-American supermodel and uh, a public speaker and an advocate, uh, a transgender advocate. Uh, Somsak Bunkam, but he tells all of us to call him Pai. Uh, and he's the founder of Local Alike, which is a um, community-based uh, tourism platform. Um, I think there is an, there is an element of, of uh, uh, fresh experiences in terms of travel, but also an ecological aspect uh, to look alike as well. And um, it's great to see um, Miguel Sioko again, who is a, a writer, a John journalist, a professor, who, who's teaching right now in, in Abu Dhabi, and a multiple award winner for his uh, for his uh, writing. So, what if the youth of ASEAN ran the region? It is an appropriate subject. The average uh, population under 25 in ASEAN is about uh, 45%. Singapore is the only sort of outlier because Singapore has, has got an aging population and a low uh, birth rate. And in most of ASEAN, um, the educational foundation is good and improving. So I think the governments, the societies, have the sense that our youth should be educated, should go out in the world, and be leaders. And this is not, this is not something new. Um, Mark Twain talked about the hope of, of youth. He said, there is no sadder sight than a young pessimist, except for an old optimist. Um, Bishop Carlos Bello, who was the 1966 co-winner uh, of the Nobel Peace Prize, said young people carry the responsibility to create a world in which peace, harmony, and fraternity reign. Kofi Annan, who used to be UN Secretary General, said, young people should be in the forefront of global change and innovation. They can be agents for development and peace. I am so glad I'm not young, <laughs> because I couldn't handle the pressure. OK, so the world is yours. So what I'm going to do first is do a whip around, starting anti-clockwise with William on my right. What is it about young people that um, gives them this advantage to be future leaders? What is their competitive uh, advantage? What are their, their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Yeah. For the strength, I really like the words of hope, right? Hope bring conviction. Hope bring this sense of idealism, this sense of purpose. And in that some sense, it's a, some sense of naive. Like today, I can be where I am today. Because eight years ago, even 10 years ago, a younger version of me today a younger William have this very strong conviction, have this very strong rebel, have this very strong hope, and he is very naive. At first, we are fail of anything. We are fail when we want to start a business. We fail to raise money. At the first time that I am trying to convince people to join my company, because when you are building a technology company, it's all about people. I stand two days 
in a job expo in my university. No one applied. So we failed on everything. We failed on convincing our first business partner and so on and so on. The young William, with his naive, he can take that failure and can be rebel and figure out a way around. One of the worst advice that I took eight years ago is uh, some potential investors say to me, William, you can only have your youth once in your lifetime. So don't waste your time. Find something more realistic to do. Don't daydreaming. All your dream about building Silicon Valley in Indonesia is not possible. Indonesia is not Silicon Valley. All these people that are able to build a successful technology company in Silicon Valley, they are born special and you are not. The young William take that as an insult, take that as a, a mission, as a purpose. I will change this. Right? So I think that youth have this naive. It's a very, very important and become their very strength. They're taking that as an opportunity to challenge the status quo. They take it to, as a mission, to against all the odds. And this is a young characterism. But their biggest strength can also be their biggest weakness. Right? So if like we see today in social media, we are start living in our own bubble. The youth with the instant gratification lifestyle. You post anything on the social media, you get instant recognition by that time. So you start to live in your bubble. You surround yourself by, uh, you only share the information that you like. You only like the information that you like, of course. And then you, you start to live on your own bubble. If we are keep maintaining that direction, we are naive on our own world, then I'm afraid that the world will be divided in a, a two uh, very extreme polar in the future. So I hope that uh, the youth can understand their strength and their weakness. In the future, they can start listening again. So they are not only post their opinion, but they can also read and listen what is the opposite of the table, what is their opinion, and find a middle ground of that. I want to come back to the social media aspect uh, uh, a little later. I think we may have an opportunity to do that about the, about the challenges of that. But Cassandra? Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with what William said about um, all of those things and, and the instant gratification. Definitely the youth today has, has a lot of motivation, a lot of drive, and all of these are, are great, great qualities. With a lot of the young people I work with in, in my work as a counsellor, I mean, I'm not a politician, I'm not an economist. If you ask me what, what great qualities they have as leaders, I think what I, what I can see is, is that determination, that drive, that desire to want to achieve something for themselves, that's something that can spear them on to um, young people, spear young people on to help them achieve the next milestone, the, the next um, big thing in their life, which I think would um, uh, also benefit all of us on the side as well. That's that's another thing I want to come back to, uh, but after we've done the, the round, uh, Gina, mm -hmm. is do you do you think? Um, that the values of, of youth, and of course it's hard to generalize yeah. across 10 countries, but do you think the values of youth are leading, uh, are trending more towards openness, inclusiveness? Uh, uh, there was just a survey just now out about the United States, and uh, the United States is a very conservative government right now, but the survey showed that the, United, the government is actually out of touch with a lot of the social values of young people which are trending towards a more liberal side. What, what is your take? Um, I think I would like to start by saying um, <coughs> J. Walter Thompson, which is a global forecasting company, did a big survey um, study in 2015 that basically um, suggested that Generation, uh, Generation Z, 81% of Generation Z identifies are more gender fluid. Like for, for the first time, there's a study that really determines that the young generation, because you know, culture being so fluid, access to so many different, um, whether the music or the globalization aspect of different cultures and how they identify, it's affecting that. So, you know, for the longest time, we've only had this idea of gender as, as a binary, but the youth are leading those components, whether from their product that they purchase or the brands that they support, you know. It is now easy to see, even like as a fashion model myself, to see so many advertising campaigns that, that really highlights and honor, um, 
you know, LGBT individuals being in the forefront of the, of the brands. So I think it makes such a difference, especially now more than ever. You know, we have access to all this information. People would tend to ask me sometimes, Gina, do you want to be identified as a, as a model who happened to be trans or a trans model? So there's obviously a big difference, but one mm -hmm. thing I could say that, you know, for the longest time when I was modeling for 10 years and not being out as a, as a trans person, I didn't have access to the visibility and sort of like a media representation for trans people in media that I didn't see. So now if I post something on a new advertising campaign that I'm doing or the projects that I'm doing and my followers in South Africa, anywhere in the world, right? They see that sense of hope in a sense that like a trans person could actually be successful and be passionate, could be an entrepreneur. So I, I would like to say that I tend to, you know, not apologize for all of those I guess the, the, the pride that I have with, with my identity, because when I, was, when I was starting out, I didn't see that reflection in the media. So I, I do my part in, in, in making sure that I tell those stories. I want to ask a follow-up question right away, because um, we may not have a chance to get back to it again. Uh, do you find that this trend is more, more pronounced, or people in the West are much more open about it than, let's say, in Asia, because you've lived in, in both uh, 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 arenas? Certainly. I think you know, as seen in the nations over here in Southeast Asia, there's certainly a big and long culture of gender fluidity. You know, I came from the culture in the Philippines where at 15 years old, I started joining transgender pageants. That is the most mainstream part of our culture in the Philippines, and that exists in many places, in Thailand, um, some places in Indonesia. So I, I think because of that long history, it's a, it's a, it's a lot that, Part of that long history allowing people to see that certain like um, social visibility for LGBT people that are part of mainstream society, but most importantly, visibility is one part of the component of, of becoming who you are. Certainly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to political representations. And I like to always say, because from where I grew up in the Philippines, LGBT, especially trans people, are culturally visible but not politically recognized. In my personal experience moving to the United States, it was almost... I mean, this is in 2001. It's important to have the context, right? I moved to San Francisco. There was a degree of political recognition, meaning I had some rights where I could change my name and gender marker. There's anti-discrimination bill. There are, there, are, there are access when it comes to um, um, medically um, supported transition-related uh, surgeries for people in California, but there's no degree of visibility. So I think growing up in the Philippines, it allowed me that sort of perspective that the yeah. sense of visibility for LGBT people has to be backed up by the political recognition because those two things, it's a very symbiotic relationship. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Pai, what do you think? What do you think is the, the best asset or the strongest asset that youth have? Uh, if you have to say it, I mean like, uh, I, I, I probably from a, uh, another different background that I, I grew up in a very small village, rural villages in, in Thailand where, I mean, uh, Lacks of like uh, economic opportunities and 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 even educational uh, uh, opportunities. I mean, we as a whole village, uh, villagers, not just like the young generation, but uh, my parents and my grandparents, we have to work hard. I mean, because of of like uh, uh, infrastructure have not been implemented, and I mean, I, I believe that if if like. Uh, in infrastructure has has been implemented. We we all we have our own thoughts, and I mean, mm -hmm. uh, because of that, that 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 why make us like who live in the very rural area totally different from who live in Bangkok because like a uh, better infrastructure there. So, from my point of view, that uh, who work very hard. I mean, in order to 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 get money to spend on our life. I mean, uh, what make I come so far to this point is that because of like a. Uh, uh, we are look seeking for opportunity ourselves, and 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 when it comes to works, I mean, we 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 know how to work more playful and, and and less stuffy in terms of youth. I mean, in young generations, I would say. Well, you know, William was talking earlier about how he was naive, and that actually that actually uh, proved to be a strength because he refused to take no and refused to take uh, take quote unquote wiser advice. And, and, and you see where he is now. What, what took you out? What drove you, motivated you to, get, to go from the village to now? Essentially, you're on a global stage. 
uh, was it you, something within you yourself, or your parents, or some mentors? What? It's, I mean, uh, uh, it's a combination of both, of both my parents and myself. I, I, I worked in hard since I was 10 years old to get out of poverty. And I think uh, when we're saying about poverty, I mean, uh, and the way that local people like us being used as just, uh, I mean, like uh, trying for other people like who live in the, the cities or those who have like a better infrastructure, they're trying to help us. I mean, mm. but uh, I want just, just want to say that if I could say, is that uh, we, own, we, we, we have our own thoughts of, of how, how we see our, ourselves, uh, I mean, of improving ourselves. Uh, we don't want to be used as just a tool. Like, uh, okay, people want to come to the local village and, and just want to help, but they don't engage in our thought. I mean, in that, I mean, they just like use us as a public cities or, 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 or their own, I mean, advantage, but they don't, don't, don't care about our thoughts and opinions. And I, I really want to do that. And that is a big force for me mm. to, to, to change my life and, and to, to work really hard and to, to get to the point. Well, the common thread I'm seeing up till now is that all of you are fighters, and you're a fighter too. You fight through words. Yeah, I do. I try, <laughs> and maybe more now. Um, what 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 drives you, and what do you think youth should be driven by if they want to if they want to take up a leadership role? Well, I'm kind of at the tail end of youth. I'm, I'm 40 now, but I, I'm very privileged that I'm able to work with people who are at the very beginning of, 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 of adulthood, uh, my students. So I get to see the whole spectrum um, from a certain perspective. And um, the students that I've spoken with feel that they've got more skin in the game. They, they, they certainly feel disempowered. Um, they, they look at the older generation who is in charge as, as a generation that isn't giving them much chance to, to participate. Um, and, and this is kind of what does drive me, uh, for us to be able to, to, to speak out, to be able to participate, to be heard. Um, I do believe that uh, freedom of speech is something that is being eroded uh, more and more, uh, especially today. And we've shifted towards this idea of responsible speech, but who who gets to dictate what is responsible and what is not, but the powers that be, the ones in charge, the older ones who perhaps don't want to listen to what the youth are saying. Um, in my experience working with these students, they, they say, well, you know, they were born into an interconnected, tolerant, uh, globalized world. Um, and looking at the, I had one student tell me, um, looking at the leaders trying to figure out how that works is like looking at your grandmother trying to figure out how a computer works, completely not understanding it, and so not using it, and just brushing it aside and saying, I'm just too old for that, for me to be able to, 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 to work with that. And a lot of the, the, the values, a lot of the concerns, a lot of the ideas that the youth really adhere to are not being taken up by the older generation. And if we were, one of the things that absolutely drives me, and if we really, to be very honest about it, is you know most of us here will agree that democracy is an important thing. It is it is the, the our, our best path towards equality. It is our best avenue to be able to get rid of abusive leaders uh, without a, a revolution. But if we look at the democracies in the ASEAN and and around the world as well, there are systems where if you are a young person with some experience and you've got a good idea and you've got a, a good following, you could become the leader of this, uh, of your country. But if we look at the democracies that we do have everywhere, that's impossible. There's too much power, there's too much corruption, there are too many dynasties. In the Philippines, for example, 80% of our legislature is ruled by dynasties. 90% of all the, of our governorships are ruled by dynasties. So to the youth who aren't part of those dynasties, access to power, access to participation is impossible. Well, Miguel has just put the cat among the pigeons with the D word, democracy, um, which ties into something that was mentioned earlier about the resilience 
uh, we've talked about the audacity of youth, but the resilience of youth. Um, uh, I, I'm based in Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, young people, particularly the uh, university students, are known or used to be known as the strawberry generation. Why strawberries? Because strawberries are easily bruised. So the strawberry generation is that Hong Kong people were regarded as, Hong Kong young people were regarded as real, the softies. Uh, and that's, uh, I know Hong Kong very well, and that's the impression I had too. Uh, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not Berkeley, this is not uh, uh, Istanbul or Cairo, okay? But 2014 changed all that uh, with the Occupy protests in Hong Kong, and it was young people going out there, uh, um, and you know, me and my team were, were, were covering it, and I was struck by the evolution uh, that this one, that, that they, they were galvanized, and it was a surprise to, to me, but it was also a surprise to the authorities in Hong Kong, and it was a huge surprise to the authorities in Beijing. Uh, suddenly they had a revolutionary situation in Hong Kong, which is a very materialistic uh, society. So if it can happen in, 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 in Hong Kong, I guess it can uh, happen uh, uh, in a lot of places. But also you have the sense of youth that are very, very caught up in, in social media. I think, I think this was mentioned earlier. They're always you know, looking at their phone or looking at their laptops. Are they really, um, are they actually within, within a bubble? Uh, that means it works both ways. We have youth who are crossing borders, Gina was saying, you know, uh, um, uh, much more open, much more global, but at the same time, they're also much more just looking at what is in front of, of, of their eyes. Is there, uh, is there a balance here or is there a conflict here? Uh, is there a case of one side wins out, one side does not, that we cannot draw a broad conclusion about the uh, 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 usefulness and the resilience of youth. This morning someone said to me, you're gonna be in this youth session? Come on, <laughs> millennials, give me a break. They're gonna take over the world? If they do, forget it. So anyone, anyone? I have a little perspective when it comes to, you know, when it comes to taking selfies, right, in this component. People would always say, oh, this whole selfie generation and what had happened, you know. And I wanna go, I mean, critically engage a little bit more when it comes to LGBT people. For the longest time, LGBT people are persecuted, right? They never had, they never see themselves reflected in media. But for us, in my community, and the people that I speak about, the people that I, the, the heron are my people, my community, right? For us, the validation of seeing yourself, taking selfie, feeling good about it is a huge thing. That's a huge thing to just that self-validation in a lot of the campaigns that happens in, in LGBT organizations when it comes to you know, photos, social sharing, when it, when it comes to like humanizing the aspect. Because a lot of times that happens when a lot of people or even like countries here, specifically in ASEAN region, where a lot of people don't know, you know who are these LGBT people, who are trans people. But the moment you see more and more in their faces who they are representing themselves when they're taking selfies or there's a campaign humanizing themselves, that makes such a difference that our community would not have to wait for a government to change policy or you know, wait for an opportunity to be on, on television to speak who we are. Like those, those certain things makes a difference. You know, I understand maybe some people like, this is too much, you know, taking the selfie generation. But for us in our, in, our, in our community, it makes such a difference to have that. I see. Thank you. Um, I think it was, I was in danger of falling off. <laughs> um, you know, um, in a sense, all of us uh, on the stage, but particularly uh, the, the five of you, are minorities in some way. Uh, when, you, when you look at it, you know, William uh, 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 being an internet entrepreneur in Indonesia, which is not as common as in, as in some other places. Cassandra and the work that she advocates. Gina, you've talked about it. Uh, uh, Pai, the, the, the path, the vocation that you've taken. Uh, Miguel. Yeah, simply your thoughts are, are put you in a, in, a, in, a, in a minority. Does does that um, uh, does that? Do you think that uh, that if, if youth are in that sort of a situation, uh, the tendency is to fight harder, or is also is there a tendency to just say, I can't beat the system? 
I can't beat the system of entrenched power, whether the power is political, social, or cultural, or economic. Uh, I can't beat the elderly. We all know that in, in Asia is generally culturally conservative. You can be economically very open, but, and politic, but, but culturally very conservative. You know, uh, youth uh, should be seen but not necessarily heard. The elders know best. So do you think, um, I think it comes to, down to this, are youth in a minority and does that, does that sense of identification help or hurt? It's Anyone? Hurt. For me, I think it's definitely help. It gives you a mentality of underdog. And as an underdog, you don't find, you don't find an excuse, right? You, have, you, you find your courage. You figure out reasons to have a perseverance, and you never, never lose hope. Right? So as underdog, you'll train harder. You'll fight harder. Yeah, you, it's all about the challenge, the status quo, against all the odds. And um, yeah, it's a beauty of being underdog. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a plus. Cassandra? I think it's a little bit of both because on one hand, that the underdog phenomena drives us to, to be more motivated to do more, achieve more, but yet um, there are those that um, feel beaten by, by what's happening out there, the control that's out there. The bigger question, I think, that there's no question that, that youth has a lot to offer in terms of leadership, in terms of, of uh, bringing the next generation forward. But the bigger question is, how can we allow the youth to have a bigger say in, in leadership while still conserving, preserving, having safeguards in place that the rule of law still survives, um, things don't get too badly out of hand, in that sense? Well, I mean, the truth is, is you know, I, I agree with that. The, the youth definitely need to be uh, given more opportunities to participate. Mm -hmm. Does, you mentioned you know, the elders know best. Do they really? I mean, look at the world that the elders have made right now. <laughs> would you say that this is a good world that, 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 that they've created? No, I would say not. Um, the youth are made to be part of a minority or made to feel like they are a minority, even though, especially in this region, they are the majority. Yes. Right? Yes. And so what's happening, at least to my perspective, is that we have these older... Um, Old, old folk, let's call them, um, who want to exclude, who want to make the, this majority a minority, and they're using the politics of uh, fear, for example, or anything that they can do to make sure that, that this, this, this teeming mass of idealistic, hungry, uh, hopeful young people um, are kept in, 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 in weakness and in fear. And if we were to look at ancient wisdom of the immortal youth icon Yoda, um, fear is the path to the dark side, right? Yeah. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hatred, hatred leads to suffering. Do you, th do you uh, um, I mean all of you, think that there is a disconnect between the youth of ASEAN trending toward a progressive direction and speaking to Miguel's point, uh, a lot of countries in ASEAN in terms of the establishment trending regressively. Uh, we can give any number of examples. Um, uh, you already talked about uh, the dynasties and the clans and of course we know what is happening with the drug war in the Philippines. In Thailand, uh, um, we are back to military rule in Thailand after some years of turbulent, but still sort of, you know, flirtations with a democratic uh, system. Um, uh, you know, Gino, you know, within your community, you've 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 seen probably both sides. Uh, Singapore, Singapore is a great success story, maybe the biggest success story. Uh, in, in ASEAN, although it is an easier place to manage than, than a lot of the other countries. We're lucky uh, in being small. Pardon? We're lucky in being small. We're lucky in being small, <laughs> but there's also that tension all the time between uh, um, uh, the status quo and... And moving and, forward. Th that's right. And in Indonesia, uh, you, uh, uh, I'm sorry? I was saying, I think that's one of the ingredients that make us as a country um, push forward and want to strive more, and that's something perhaps that um, youth um, it, it came with our youth as a country, not just as, as a people. So perhaps that's one of the qualities that we're looking at as well. 
Actually, again, so we, so we don't miss getting to this. When I was talking about Hong Kong strawberry generation, does Singapore have an equivalent? I would say uh, because definitely. Singapore is even more comfortable than Hong Kong. Yes, I would say definitely yes. As we move forward, um, definitely that strawberry generation is there. Many of the young people I see um, today have a lot of aspirations. Um, they want everything ready um, on the table. They, they definitely want, we all want better lives. Um, we all um, buy into lots of different ideas, such as have a, having a, a better, cleaner, more sustainable world, um, having equality, no, no discrimination and stuff like that. But um, a lot of people wanting all of this, but we're not really getting there yet. And, and I think the platform for achieving all of this um, still needs to happen. As, as a counselor, I work with my clients when they are unhappy, um, when they're, they're depressed, looking at tools, um, giving them tools to be able to achieve, succeed what they, they feel that um, it's going to help them achieve that sense of balance and well-being in their life. For the youth of this generation, what, is, what are those tools going to be? Um, is the internet enough? What more needs to be done? But, but um, again, just to follow up, yeah. are, Sing are young Singaporeans hungry enough? I would say some are, some are not. I, similarly as, as how it would be in, in many other parts of ASEAN as well. See. And, you know, Indonesia has got a huge, the demographics, um, uh, and simply by being, correct me if I'm wrong, is the biggest, it is, it's the biggest population in ASEAN, right? Yeah, 40%. Uh, yeah. So, so you have more young people than in, just by dint of that. Um, um, are, are they hungry enough? Are they motivated enough? So I have an experience to now our organization employ 1,300 people and I am considered the older folks in the organization. So on average they are 23 years old. Uh, this is most likely their first jobs for majority of them. So I have an experience early days, when, especially when we are a small startup. We cannot even hire someone with experience. And a youth come in association with inexperience, right? And when they join the company, they don't have a clue how to actually do their jobs. And it comes to me and asks me that how I can uh, do this task. And I think it's all about the mindset. And I, when I see the task, I myself also don't have experience to do that. When you don't know what you don't know, you cannot guide other people to do that stuff. So what I try to do is uh, actually implement that mindset to them, build a culture around that. That actually is a good quote from Henry Ford. He's saying that whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you are both right. right? So I'm actually using that quote to all the youth that seek for advice on how they solve a problem. So it's a come from the mindset. If you think you can't, you surrender at that point of time, it's proof that you are right you will fail. But if you think that you can, but you still don't know how, and you figure out using 24 hours, seven days, your time, I have time, you have time, and you use your time to figure out the, the way, you'll figure out that way. And I think the youth just need more trust and opportunity. When you give that trust and opportunity to them, with an ecosystem that you can make a mistake, but you need to learn from that mistake, with the culture around that, then a lot of magical things actually happen. Just want to bring up one topic before we we, we turn it open to the uh, to the to the audience here and outside. Um, so, how is it possible to for youth to encourage or even institute change where you persuade governments, society, the wider society, even your own families, to uh, get with the program, to get with the program of youth? How how? How is that possible, or is it is it that means is it bottom up, or does it have to be top down? That you have to get leadership, whether it's political or business leadership, that recognizes that this is the way forward. Especially when you have such a big part of your population, your society, so young. I would like Thoughts? to say something to you know what William was saying about opportunity and hunger. I mean, there's definitely something to be said, you know, for ASEAN as a regional body that 
when it comes to LGBTI rights, we are so far from, from it. We haven't even addressed any of this bigger issue. So, so to think about like the hunger and to have an opportunity, there's an absolute disconnect because LGBT people can't fully participate if we don't have our rights. You know, same-sex uh, relationships are criminalized in three countries like Brunei, Singapore, and Myanmar. My transgender brothers and sisters are criminalized still right now in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. How could we even fully participate if we don't have the rights mm -hmm. that leads to absolute violence and death? So as, as sad as it may sound, this is the reality that we live that yes, we could talk about the, the, you know, the progressive nature of having you know, youth being the majority here in um, ASEAN as a regional body, but right. we need to address these bigger topics because we can't even fully participate. We can't, you know, for example, if you don't have a gender recognition law that allows trans people to change their name and gender marker on their legal documents, and somebody's applying for a job with a disconnect in your identification, how could you even like, you know, dignify yourself. The first question that the HR person would say is about why is this disconnect? You know, so even within that, there's a disconnect. So right. how could you even get to the point where you're going to be talking about your capabilities? So it's important that we're talking about right. the progressive nature of this, but my community can't even participate, can't even feel humanized, dignified in our world. So you, you, you're talking about haven't even got to that first stage of 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 of, of basic rights. Miguel, I get a sense that you're, you want to say something. No, I think Gina's <laughs> absolutely right. And I, I think that speaks to not just that community, but to all of the youth community, representation. Yes. You know, we don't, have the we don't have representation. And this is going back to my point about democracy, is that that's just the essence of what the system is about, representation for our rights uh, and for, for all of us, for our concerns to be heard and to participate. And Gina's absolutely right. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and when you combine it, I think, with, you know, what, are the, what is the business case? You know, there was this big um, um, study that uh, USAID and uh, UCLA Williams Institute did a study on 39 countries, 29 are emerging markets. The relationship within, you know, LGBT inclusion and what it means for um, the economic output of countries. And what they found out is that if countries have affirming for their LGBT rights, there's actually an actual economic imperative around that. Like there's a bigger GDP um, growth per capita. Like this is huge to think about like on those terms that it's a good economic business model, business case to have LGBT rights for countries. This is a big study that they did that was released in 2014. That's interesting, Pi, because the, the, the work that you're doing and, and, and the company that you have combines uh, uh, both a uh, sort of a, a socioeconomic, moral, ethical imperatives, but also your business as well. So, so uh, is that one way to be able to sort of sell progressive ideas, progressive values, progressive businesses that also give young people a chance? Well, uh, definitely yes. I mean, uh, like uh, the reason that I, 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 I focus on sustainability and sustainable development in Thailand because we see a lot of problems where, I mean, like, uh, uh, income is not distributed equally in Thailand. And, and, and I think one of the big industry that we should focus on in Thailand is tourism industry, for sure. Mm. And, mm. and I think uh, when saying about opportunities, I think tourism is one of the opportunities that, that, that rural villages or people who live in, in far away from Bangkok can, can tap on. So. And what would be the way that they can tap on? I mean, if we focus on just the economic aspect of it, like just the income size of it, it's going to be sustainable in the wrong one as well. So what uh, we are trying to focus on and, and, and what I'm trying to represent uh, the whole villages, I mean, we, we work with 70 villages across Thailand, is that uh, please put uh, emphasize or priority on uh, on ability, I mean, capabilities of, of us, I mean, of people who live there. We, what, the only thing that we need is just knowledge and, 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 and the people who, who, who come in a perspective that they don't know better than us. They know uh, equally the same with us. We probably know better because we live in that area. And I think uh, from the past six years that have been working on this, uh, uh, trying to balance, I mean, we know that mass tourism in Thailand is here, but sustainable tourism is still here. Mm. Uh, how we can like 
I'm not saying that mass tourism has to be go away in Thailand because uh, uh, it's some. I mean, it it, it comes with a lot of opportunity for us as well. But how to make sustainable tourism come equally? Mm. I think, and and that way, uh, seeing tourism as one of the the opportunity for youth for sure. Because like uh, many many of, of of youth or young generation in Thailand, even in the rural village, they they got education somewhere, but they tend not to come back home. So I think tourism is one of the very sexy work kind of thing that, that can, can attract them come to work, uh, come back and work at home and so that they can spend time with their parents. It's, it seems a natural development for, for Thailand and for young Thais since tourism is such a big part of, e uh, of your economy. Questions, any questions from the floor? Anyone? Yes, this gentleman please. Hi. Thank you. It, firstly, it feels quite old, uh, like yourself, listening to millennials and, and trying to figure out how to, to even... Uh, Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> but one question I have, and William will, will attest to this a little bit, is in the region, if you look at, uh, do we have younger people, I and mean, you talked about it, Miguel, not enough representation. I don't see enough people stepping up either. Unfortunately, in Indonesia, where I come from and William comes from, we've had a bit of a setback recently with one of the most honest people that we elected as a governor um, being accused of blasphemy and ending up in jail. And relatively young. Relati very young. Yeah. And if I look around the region, whether it's Singapore uh, with, with its own traditions of democracy, mm -hmm. uh, or the Philippines, um, or Thailand with its own challenges, I'm not seeing enough younger people still stepping up uh, it's one thing to say, yes, we're not represented, but are you seeing people stepping up? I don't see enough in, in Indonesia either, so I don't know if that's something that is not being, it's a push or is it is a pull, I, I can't understand, but would do, like the thoughts of the, the younger kids here. Do people agree here? I, young I, people I are do. not setting up I and wa uh, stepping up, and why? Because there's a wall uh, in front of them. The, the politics is dirty, and it's, it's corrupting, and we've seen throughout history that those who go into it, have to play the game to survive and in that way become corrupted. Um, I grew up uh, with a, a political family and I, I chose not to enter it even though I wanted to participate because I knew that that wasn't the way uh, that I could, I was afraid of it. And um, talking to a lot of my students, they feel that, you know, politics have become about blame and you're always blaming the previous administration or blaming the past. Um, and therefore you don't want to step up because then you will be blamed and you are, you are primed to fail because the system is so against you. And, and so that's why, um, especially here at the World Economic Forum, a, a lot of the young people that, that I've seen and connected with, they're doing things outside of government um, because mm. obviously the care is there, but the system is stacked against them. Cassandra, Singapore, we were talking about a couple yep. of points that you made, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Singapore, the government does uh, go out of its way to groom young people and to bring them in into the system, groom them for leadership, so long as they're not Amos Yee. <laughs> uh, uh, so do you think, uh, is Singapore, uh, uh, more enlightened, you know, this whole, you know, uh, 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 top to bottom thing? Or, renewal or of leadership is definitely something that's very, very important. As, as one day, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, the youth are going to take over this world and it will be their turn. Um, but what's more important other than creating a space for the youth to, to have leadership positions is also the youth themselves, or ourselves in this case rather, taking up that ownership and, and accountability for themselves, for their generation, for their minority, whatever it may be, to, to have a voice to champion what they believe in and, and not just on their, their butts and complain in that sense, get off their laurels and do something about it. See. And I want to add on the Miguel point. I mm -hmm. think that this is a process. On the unjust oppression, I have a conversation with Brian, and she said a very good quote. On the unjust oppression, humanity and impact leader will born. Right? So, and we see this through the history. And recent uh, case in Indonesia, for example, there will be an example. They will create a movement. Hopefully, if the youth step up, then it will create a movement that politician, clean politician is aspiration. Mm -hmm. But we need a more role model about that. And it takes time. It cannot be just instant. If the youth expect instant gratification, then we'll live in the bubble. But if the youth start 
to instead of mm -hmm. avoid the game, but enter the game and fix the game from within, yes. fix oh. the system from yeah. within, then I believe that we have hope. I actually always encourage a youth to dream with their eyes open because to only have a dream is very easy. Mm -hmm. And dream with the eyes open, I, my, my way of dream with the eyes open is what you dream, what you think, what you talk or what you speak, and what you do is always the same, consistent. You can dream about one thing, but then you need to think a plan how to really ex uh, realize that dream. And you can need to be able to speak or talk about it to inspire people, to move people, to join that movement. And the most important, can you really do it, execute it? Like so. Well, that's a, it's a hard thing. I mean, you, you, but if you look at all the protests in the Philippines, for example, you look at the, who, who, who led the, the protests in the Umbrella Revolution, the Occupy uh, movement, uh, Tiananmen Square, for example, um, the, the protests there, they were all the youth, right? So they care. They obviously do, but they just don't know how to get to the next uh, level, how, how to participate. And of course, you know, it, it's so difficult. They've got to get jobs afterwards. Um, they, they want to have children. Their, their parents have uh, uh, imposed certain duties upon them, you know, that they, they have to fulfill. They want to fall in love. You know, they want to have fun. They want to travel. I mean, there, there's so many things that, that, that uh, occupy them that, that it, it's hard for them to go from protesting, especially when they're not heard, to participating. It's interesting you mentioned that because the, uh, the umbrella of revolution, sort of the de facto leader of it now is uh, Joshua Wong, who started an, being an activist at the age of 15, which was on, which was on an, a huge education issue, which brought out 90,000 people in Hong Kong. Now he's the voice, he's now 20, and he's already a veteran. But you know what people say about Joshua Wong in Hong Kong? Nobody's going to give him a job. Exactly. Well, all of you are activists in some form or other, and which means that all of you are political in some form or other, uh, or other even, uh, even beyond the conventional meaning of being political or being in politics. But would any of you or all of you actually enter formal politics in your arenas? I'm too much of an artist. I'm probably not, you know. <laughs> but. One thing I would say when it comes to activism, or even the definition of activism, especially with, with the internet and the many revolutions that we have seen, you know, it's not just all about like going to the streets and like have, you know, and protesting in the seats rallying. That's one thing, and that's a big component of it. But I think certainly for, for LGBT people, for my community, you know, people would always ask me, especially the young generations that I talk to, I want to be an activist just like you, you know, I, I want to do all that stuff. And I always tell them, you know what, in this reality that we're dealing with when it comes, especially in this region, for LGBT youth specifically, just to be a successful person, whatever that is that you're doing is your biggest advocacy that you could give to the world, that you could show to the world that despite all of these challenges, despite governments and systems, uh, oppressive systems that doesn't want me to be successful, but I made it, not saying like specifically me, but like as a person, that as a proclamation, that is the biggest advocacy, is that personal success, living your life, being passionate, whether it's through business, whether it's through the arts. I, th those are some of the things that I, I talk to a lot of the, L the LGBT youth that I speak about, is that be, choose that path of passion, of, of something that you're passionate about, and be the most successful person as you could be. So leadership by example, just by what you do, Role mo uh, uh, as role models. Question for, from the audience? Question from the audience? No? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you uh, for your wonderful discussion and, and sharing. Uh, my name is Shruti. I'm from Auckland, New Zealand, and part of the Global Shapers community here, so the 20 to 30 year old youthful cohort. Um, we've got a number of kind of young people in the audience, and I was curious to hear what uh, kind of insight or advice might you have given all the challenges, all the systemic barriers that we've discussed, what would be your advice to young people in this room to really step up and lead to create a better ASEAN in the future? Can, can I, oh, go ahead. Sure. Um, and you're not from ASEAN. I'm engaged in ASEAN. Like, it's very yeah. important to <laughs> but not directly. <laughs> Thank you for your concern. No, no, seriously, I, I say that seriously. I, I just finished teaching a semester um, at the university, and 
I, I was trying to get my students to, it's a round table discussion in, in that course that we have, uh, Novels That Change the World. And everybody would always timidly raise their hand. And it was an experiment that I had throughout the course of the, the, uh, the semester, if they would start to feel comfortable and stop raising their hands. And at the, at the end of the, the course, I, I told them, you know, my one big criticism of you guys, before you give your teacher evaluation uh, to me, um, is that you all know how to listen. You're all polite. You all have something to say. So if you know how to listen, you also know how to not talk over somebody. Right? So why are you raising your hand? Why aren't you just jumping in? Right? So that is my advice, is quit raising your hand. Yeah, I think I would say I, li I live in the United States, right? With the current political reality that we're dealing with, especially for LGBT rights. People would always say, oh, what are we going to do now? This is horrible. All of a sudden, it was you know, we're moving to a certain direction and all of a sudden we swung on the other side. And people would ask me, what do we do now? How are you dealing with this, Gina? And sometimes because of my experience being born and raised in the Philippines, I, 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 I want to honor that experience because in the Philippines we somehow managed to survive, with, even without those political rights, mm -hmm. right? And I think it is the reliance with your community, finding that community that wants to support you and love you and be the best possible person that you are, that's allowed me to survive you know, as a young person. I could not ask for better uh, formative years at 15, joining you know, the culture of transgender beauty pageants in the, in the Philippines mm -hmm. that allowed me to be myself. I found my best friends. I found my other family. So mm -hmm. I, I suggest to a lot of the youth is find, that, find those communities that want you to be the most successful person as you could be. Anyone from the, anyone else from the floor? Uh, I thought, yes, I saw this one, please. I almost wasn't about to raise my hand and just ask. <laughs> um, but I'm also a global shaper. I'm from a hub in Thailand. So I think this, Miguel reminded me of something important, which is that I don't think the youth don't want to speak, but we get jailed. Because jail, I, I think gender is a fluid concept, but so is being jailed in this part of the world. I come from Thailand. People get jailed by you know, all the time for things that legally they shouldn't be jailed for. So I'm wondering, as a region, we seem to have this problem in different countries in the region. Do you think that as a region we would be more effective if somehow we got together and dealt with this issue as a region rather than trying to deal with it individually as countries because we know we can't do it as individuals in a country? Every time I go back home, my mother calls me and says, don't say stuff. Hmm. So I know on an individual level, I cannot. I know that in what happened yesterday in one of the events here, other people were also shut down and their heads patted. So what can we do as a region? Do you think that it's more effective as a region? And if so, what is the tactic? So essentially, uh, I think you're, you're, you're asking or maybe even proposing a sort of an ASEAN youth network. Now, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, there are youth activists from outside of ASEAN uh, uh, who would like to connect with ASEAN youth for precisely the reasons that you mentioned, that perhaps the challenges are even uh, uh, are greater and more widespread within uh, you know, that 10-member body uh, than they are uh, uh, elsewhere. Because if you look at ASEAN as, a, as one grouping, one nation, if you like, then, then man, you really got a lot of challenges. Uh, is that, would that be effective, do you think, William? I think Forum, for example, is uh, doing a very good job, right? So global shapers, they identify a very uh, uh, youth with a certain cause and gather them together, give them exposure, and then young global leaders. And it's not only for the region. We just have a new president of France. It's a, a YG cohort, uh, 2000, 2016. So we need to start from somewhere. I think that uh, Forum do a very good job in gathering us around uh, with, a, with a different uh, talents, but with a, there's a, some silver lining between that challenge. Does, 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 does having a public profile, and all of you uh, here, uh, if you didn't have it before, you certainly have it now, does that help protect you? 
Does that help give you a platform to spread your message? Sometimes as an underdog, you just need to know that you are not alone in this. Right? So you just need to have a reminder that you're fighting for a, a cause that matters. And again, there's nothing in stone. And you go back home and you figure out. I think for me, outside profile, public profile, whatever that component entails, right? For me, just from my personal experience as a young trans girl who had the dream, who grew up poor in the Philippines, who was able to um, pursue my dream in New York City, and to have that realization that after 10 years of living as a model, being in the closet, even my model agent did not know I was trans because it's completely a completely different circumstance at that time. My, my, the, the thing that I tell myself is like, how could I not? How could I not be so public about this? How could I not be so unapologetic about who I am? Because I somehow was given this opportunity to, to, to be myself, right? And to have access to certain networks of people. I mean, being here in World Economic Forum, like I certainly, I'm, I, I hope the, the conversa conversation will continue. I would love to see more transgender people being invited in this panel. I would love to see LGBT rights being discussed more. So I think besides the public profile component, I was, I, I'm, I'm doing it because that sense of gratitude that I was able to live my dream, I just wanted to somehow be vocal about it. Whether, whether you consider that giving back, I just want to be vocal with the life that I've lived. Cassandra, you, you've, you've said, we've all said, you know, Singapore is a very compact place. Mm -hmm. Would you, uh, or perhaps you're already doing it in some form, but would you be thinking about spreading your advocacy beyond the borders of Singapore? Absolutely. Whether it is through, I mean, certainly it's through uh, a, a forum like this, mm -hmm. uh, but w what is your thinking on that? Absolutely, because I think um, the issues of disability are not just faced within, it, just in Singapore alone, and it's definitely across ASEAN. A lot of the, the issues that the 17 million disabled people in ASEAN face is, are similar, and um, fighting for equality on, on that platform is definitely um, the same as well, wherever you are in ASEAN. And um, moving forward from there, looking at different ways where we can create more equality, more space where, where um, merit, um, whatever you do, can help you achieve your dreams in, in whichever field you choose. I think that's, that's very, very important um, to me and something I'm passionate about as well. And isn't organizing always a good idea? Sorry? You know, isn't organizing always a good idea? You know, going back to the question. Um, you know, you, you share best practices, you know you're not alone, as, as mm -hmm. William says. Um, you know, you look at the, the, the pen um, network of writers around the world, they advocate for those writers who are in danger. We make sure that, uh, that, that the, those who are imprisoned are, are heard, amnesty. I mean, there, there are all of these things that, that the ASEAN could, especially the youth of ASEAN, can, can take from organizations that have come together. Um, because as, as, as we started out the session saying, we are the majority, and yet we, it does seem that we are compartmentalized, pushed aside, and, and largely disorganized. Well, I think we've all said some quite subversive things uh, today. And I mean subversive not necessarily in terms of uh, uh, overthrowing, but words like protest, activism, democracy, organization, networking, spreading beyond borders. Uh, uh, Sounds like a business. <laughs> <laughs> Globalization, right? So um, yeah, all, all tremendous uh, food for thought. Uh, coming back to Mark Twain, he, he talked about, you know, uh, uh, sort of no youth should be, should be pessimists. Uh, uh, well, well uh, uh, it doesn't sound like any of you guys are, uh, uh, and I wish you luck. Uh, and that's coming not from an old optimist, but from an old pessimist. So thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you to, to, to all of you on the stage. Thank you to all of you in the audience here and uh, 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 online. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.